Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. Behold the pretty filthy creatures. My name is Eric and I'm joined today by Michael. Yeah, I, I don't know if they're that filthy. I guess they are pretty filthy, aren't they? We have a double feature today about not letting go and it involves two different films. It does. Uh, it, one of those films is the Spanish jaunt. The skin I live in, and then the Miranda Spanish jaunt. Yes, that's what you're going to go it's a with. Jaunt right. through Spain. Okay, and then um, the Miranda July joint, uh, the future. Did you attend some kind of uh, film critique class this weekend or something? No, I just call everything joint because I think uh, Spike Lee's a goofball. <laughs> good. All right, that's good. I can stop editing that out of every single intro uh, we do. Then it'll be funny. Um. We're going to spoil these movies. We're going to talk about the entirety of both films and uh, spoil them really tremendously. Pretty much as hard as we can. Probably, right? That might not be true at all. Maybe we never even get halfway through the movies. I have no idea what's... Uh, I was going to make a Kreskin future joke, an Ed Wood future joke. Was that Kreskin? Criswell. I've forgotten everything we've, Criswell. we've learned on the show. I should know that. Criswell, that's important. We're going to spoil the movies, so use the chapters. That's all I wanted to tell people. They don't have to get spoiled. They can just use the chapters and uh, skip over the movie they haven't seen. Yeah. Um, I apologize in advance for every time I'm going to call Robert Antonio Banderas. Okay. I just, I know I'm going to get excited. All right. And uh, that's what's going to happen. The Skin I Live In is a movie starring Antonio Banderas. As Robert. And I think the last time we saw him, probably the last time I've seen him in anything, was Haywire. I mean, as far as uh, yeah. release dates, right? Yeah. The thing I remember about that conversation is I was a little sad that young, smooth Antonio Banderas was gone. And uh, <laughs> it was, you know, old, decrepit, insane looking replaced by, Replaced by Mandy Patinkin Banderas. Well, the thing is, uh, turns out that that's movie magic because here's Antonio Banderas in a movie from not terribly long ago. Still, I think, looking pretty fucking smooth. Yeah, he looks just like the father from The Misbehaviors, which for me is the uh, quintessential look for Antonio Banderas with the slicking his hair back sure, as right. he gets in the elevator. It was the apex of the Banderas. <laughs> right. This, uh, this film was really bizarre for me when it came out because. It got a ton of critical acclaim. It got some gold statue was thrown at it. Sure, I don't right, one which of those. one or for what reason? Uh huh. And initially, I was kind of interested in it because Antonio Banderas, right? Mm -hmm. That's I mean, that's enough to get me into a film, right? And I remember thinking, this is a drama, and maybe I'll get around to watching it. And then I read somewhere it's a thriller. Sure. Which completely <laughs> the word thriller is what sold me. Completely yeah. changed the whole perception of what this film might be. And so I got my hands on it, but then I neglected to watch it for a long time until and we talked about this uh, a couple weeks ago. I saw it on a list of the best horror movies you didn't see. Oh, did you? Yeah. And I was like, so now it's a horror thriller starring Antonio Banderas. So this is funny. Let's talk about this just for a minute here, because I, I want to point out that we are not um, impervious to the same fucking things we complain about all the time with the packaging of a movie sure. and the way it's marketed and the spin. Uh, the Skin I Live In is the same movie it would be with, you know, just another cover. Right. But if you had put some gore on the cover. Sure and uh, put Antonio Banderas in some shadows or something, we probably would have put it on our show four years ago. Right. You know what I well, mean? The thing is, is it, it kind of goes back to our feelings on spoilers. This is, this is the problem with even getting a single line plop synopsis before you see the right. film. Mm -hmm. Because the second I have an idea of what a film might be, right. I'm going to judge whether or not I'm going to see it at midnight. And if the answer is no, I may never see it. <laughs> sure. Uh, you know what sure, I mean? Right. Um, yeah, it's just weird to think about the packaging of it is uh, something that, well, it, it's really kind of ironic because 
it kept it off our show for this long, not knowing how much it would fall in the vein of the things we know we like a hundred fucking percent of the time. Right. But also, having just been pretty horror heavy, we decided we're going to move away from that for a few weeks. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, we do the skin I live in and we go, oh, whoops. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those are only, I think, areas of the movie. I wouldn't call it, you know, I, I don't think I'd walk away from this going, oh, man, that was totally a horror movie in disguise. But it is as much a horror movie as a lot of the things we've just easily sure. called horror movies. I guess the weird thing about horror movies now is that it's kind of moved into two camps. One is where it's trying to scare you and one is just where it's violent or weird sure. and it upsets you. There's a difference between being frightened and being upset. But both right. of them fall under being <laughs> horrified. Well, and I think the skin I live in would do a little bit of both of those things. Yeah. Um, it's also funny to think about too, a lot of the parallels with, uh, remember we saw at the music box a couple of years back, we saw eyes without a face. Yeah. I think was the name of that movie. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that this movie actually has a lot in common with that so much as just the marketing approach and the cover, um, making an icon kind of out of the, uh, you know, the face mask right. there being some similarity there, but people, when you go, Oh yeah, eyes without a face, what is that? I think most people would say classic horror film. Sure. It's actually a lot of the other elements of the skin I live in that I really, uh, really just fucking adore. I think the, you know, the careful fixation on items in the beginning of the movie, everything mm -hmm. is very quizzical, you know? Sure. There's the Petri dishes and the surgical utensils, and uh, we kind of take a moment to study everything as we're figuring out what the fuck is going on. And that kind of discovery is really, I, I think, is my favorite thing about this. I know I've been harping on this a lot on the show uh, lately, and I don't think that's going to change either. But especially as you see more and more things and you start to anticipate where movies are going to go, that component of mystery is, it's the one thing that after doing our show for this long, uh, another thing I'm not going to stop harping on, that will draw me into, you know, that drew me into Lost when it came out. Yeah. And that drew me into a lot of the serialized TV that you and I like. Um, that made me really like Spiral and Primer. Sure. Is kind of going, well, what the fuck is happening? Okay, I'm getting details. I'm solving some kind of case. Yeah. Those uh, two movies in particular to go back over again. Right. And kind of comb through them. And it's interesting for me that you, you mentioned Lost because I think for me this film does another thing that Lost did. But something that, so this is interesting, something that I tend to defame Lost for, but I think this film can be championed for doing, mm -hmm. which is as the film unfolds in the earlier acts, you get a lot of, it's almost like exposition, but it's character development oh, in yeah. the form of exposition that in any film ever made other than this one would be a hamster style. Yeah. Totally. I'm speaking yeah. most specifically of the hard fireproof skin. Yeah. Right. That any other film would end the movie with her, him being in a fire and having to sure. rescue, sure. rescue Robert from a steamroller or so some... looking for reasons that the film is right. going to be worse. But instead we get this revelation that he's invented a fire retardant, extra hard skin layer mm -hmm. and instead of that being a plot point it's a look into robert's character it's a look right into his lack of being able to move on from the death of his wife and it's also a look into his mad scientist tendencies to to sure, go outside sure. of the allowable social you know, right, things that a right. scientist can do and uh, and and take it to a level of obsession to the point where it's it's harmful. Right. To not to everybody. Mm -hmm. A lesser production would unveil these things and then use them as crutches. Sure. For the remainder of the film. Sure. As opposed to unveil them and go, yeah, I mean, that's a thing he did, but that's that's not what we're doing here. Right. That's that guy. But that's not this movie. I think even when we start to get the backstory, there's just as many questions along the way. It's a constant give and take. 
You know, the movie starts and it, it has a very, uh, every scene is, you know, kind of got that curiosity. From the first time we see the woman in the suit and she's posing and, you know, you're watching it not uh, immediately sure if you're even looking at the human form right? until you, you can kind of pull back a little bit. Robert works inside a glass box. You know, why? What is he doing there? Sure. You also don't know uh, how much of this woman being trapped here is her being trapped or is perhaps part of the science, right? Sure. Well, if, if she's a willing subject that this is the final stages of some process. Right. Yeah, it's it's the way... Well, when you see how uh, how meticulous everything is in terms of the surgery and it has to be clean and you know, right. precise. Exactly. It's, is she trapped or are we just being clean and sterile? Sure. You know what I mean? Exactly. Are we delivering things to her through a window because... It's a, a near, I don't want to say airtight, but she's kind of in a vacuum chamber. Or is she a prisoner there? The beginning of the movie for me was so confusing mm -hmm. because everything is so natural and the performances are so genuine. That so natural, like when uh, the tiger man approaches the gate. That's when things, that's, so, that's where I okay. would mark act two. Okay. Is, uh, and that's what I was, that's what I was about to get into is, is the first three characters that we're introduced to. Right, right. They're so unconcerned with the development of a plot. Sure. Those three characters have been stagnating in that environment for a very long time. Right. And they've interacted solely with one another and they don't have a strong need to explain themselves because right. they orbit around each other and have seen every facet of each other's character. Mm -hmm. They've all known each other for a long time. One person has built the other. I mean, yeah. these three characters have no way of exposition. Yeah, no need to explain themselves to each other. Exactly. So you throw in a Tiger Man from Carnival. Uh, <laughs> sure. And I don't mean the show. For the first time yeah. on Double Feature, um, we get random Tiger Man who shows his ass to a camera. Right. And suddenly I go, oh, this is definitely a horror movie, isn't it? Oh, see, I went, oh, this is definitely Spanish. Oh, okay. <laughs> see, was... I, I, thought, I thought this was going to be some sort of cheesy throwaway. Oh, here comes, here comes the first body or whatever. Right. You know what I mean? Right. We've seen horror movies where they introduce characters for the slaughter. That's part of the fun. Sure. And that whole, again, the whole development of, oh, that's her son. And, oh, there's a background here. And, oh, there's this backstory. And this applies to that and such and such a thing. Mm-hmm. Now we've introduced this catalyst for more character exposition. Right. But the exposition comes from a weird place because that character knows every other character. Right. Yeah. From See, a different point again. of view. Right. And so instead of the full, I mean, I want fucking full frontal character profile. I want a goddamn <laughs> spinning naked Antonio Banderas with pop up video. Right. right. At this point. Right. right. <laughs> but instead we get this guy and nobody questions who he is. Everybody understands who he is. Everybody knows why he's there. Right. He knows who these people are. Oh, you look just like her. We should fuck first. Well, I know that makes it even and right. So exactly. you're going, this is more David Lynch territory. Yeah. Where a guy in an animal suit shows up and nobody thinks it's weird and he rapes characters. Right. Well, and it's and you're sitting there going, is he raping her? Is she into this? Have they had right. sex yeah. before? I wasn't yeah. under the impression that this person was even a human like a year ago. Yeah. So the film kind of throws you into a tumultuous relationship between every character. And then we get that scary moment where we see Robert's violent side, mm -hmm. which is just fucking immediately juxtaposed against here's the backstory. Here's everything you wanted. And it's only getting sure. worse in, in almost, um, Irreversible. Remember Irreversible? Yeah, definitely. That's where I start getting pangs of Irreversible because we go, this is where it ends. Right. Here's how it started, and here's how it started for real. Well, and the way it starts, too, it almost seems... That, that's where I feel there's that give and take, those questions again. Because it starts in a way where I'm going... Hold on, we started too early. Yeah. I don't care about all this fucking party stuff yeah. that has nothing to do with <laughs> present day. Like, don't give me six years ago. Give me, like, six months ago. Yeah. And... I, you know, I'm a total sap. I fall for these films all the time. But once again, not for a second do I go, how are these things related? How are they all going to come together? You know, I'm sitting here going, this must be irrelevant. I don't see how these things could possibly be related. And then when you figure out what happens, 
I mean, I'm punched in the face with it. Yeah. I'm going, no, who saw that coming? Even though clearly, like, why are they, why are they that far back in time? Sure. Who are these new characters? How do they become sure. relevant? But I think that's, you know, that is such a critical thing for uh, why this movie is amazing. So many different movies will, you know, uh, ask what will happen instead of, you know, they treat the backstory like it's a chore. Sure. Exposition. Yeah. It comes out of our mouths like it's a terrible thing. Yeah. Like, oh, well, we have to have exposition. Let's just sure. try and get it over with as, as fast as we possibly can. And instead of being so diehard into what will happen in this movie, uh, it makes people beg for information, even in that backstory. And I think begging for information is something that, you know, I'll come out and champion it all the time. But the reason is that it keeps you uh, engrossed in a movie. Sure. You know, you sit up and you go, God, I got to pay attention to this. I got to know what's happening. Who are these people now? Mm -hmm. And to, um, to not confuse an audience, but still keep them full of questions. Sure. I mean, that's something that, you know, mysteries uh, struggle with all the time. Right. Film noir, we talked about as a genre that's just full of questions, but maybe overwhelmed by it uh, in cases. And so to sit on that, that very careful line here of let's give people answers, but do it in a, in a way that also creates new questions. Sure. And then once you finally got all the answers, instead of the next natural step, which is, well, why are we even watching anymore? It goes... Oh, I got all the answers and this is fucking horrifying. Sure. What could possibly happen now? Right. You immediately find that out and then your movie's over. Yeah. I mean, is that not a perfect exercise of a of a film? Oh, I think it's fantastic. And I think the big thing with with this movie is that the whole time you're sitting there going, "Yes, but what?" and and they keep giving you these these side answers and you keep right. going, "Yes, but what about this?" And then right, they go, well, right. also this and this. Oh, I, yeah, okay, but what about this thing? This yeah, one I'm cataloging thing. cataloging that. That's nice. Uh-huh. But tell me the thing. And then, and then eventually the film goes, oh, oh, I get what you mean. Yeah, right, he turned right. that boy into a girl. And you oh, go. Oh, yeah, that wasn't obvious. I'm sorry. You might not have been around for when that happened. You just go, wait, what? And they go, yeah. yeah, that's the answer. And you go, what? And they're like, anyway, moving on. This was an idea you and I had from before we even started doing Double Feature, where we came to this realization that if characters have known each other for a long time, they would not give exposition. And so it's a really, um, really captivating place to come into a story when you're just dropped in sure. and you have to catch up with the characters. And I think that still holds true all these years later. We see that in something like The Skin I Live In, and it's just as you know, on the point as when we talked about it uh, years and years ago, just being thrown into something and having to, to catch up, it gives the audience a lot of credit. And I think ultimately it makes them more interested in, you know, in your movie. Yeah. Let's talk about that horror moment, though. Sure. I mean, that is it's it's something I don't think we should avoid. Oh, yeah. I feel like as we talk about this now and for people who didn't chapter and haven't seen the movie, you know, we're dropping this kind of bomb in the plot of. Oh, yeah. And then, you know, transgender surgery. Anyways, all this other stuff is going on. Uh, the film doesn't treat it like it's the heaviest goddamn thing in the world, but it is, isn't right. it? Yeah. I mean, this is this is the big if you're going to put it on a list of top horror movies, whatever. Uh, this is pretty fucking awful. Oh, yeah. And then there is the sort of sadism that goes along with uh, not only did I remove your genitalia and give you this operation, uh, I'm now going to mold you into something that is visibly indistinguishable from what you used to be. And there's and all these. And then I'm going to fuck you. Right, right. <laughs> it's some sort of uh, ultimate psycho revenge type. You know, you could never feel the pain of what you caused this woman unless I completely changed everything about your gender identity and, uh, you know, psychologically tortured you. There is a moment when I don't think that about Robert, and I'm wondering when that, you know, Robert is introduced to us as world-class surgeon, done uh, three of the nine of these, these types of facial operations, uh, has developed a new scientific breakthrough, gene splicing be damned, and he makes a really great, uh, you know, I won't go on and on about it here, but he does make a really good and passionate argument for 
we're able to splice pig genes to make our tomatoes grow better. Everybody accepts that, or let's say all rational people accept that. Why can't we do the same for the science of surgery? Mm -hmm. This is a guy I get behind in the beginning. And there is a moment where I had to kind of wake up to the realization that no, he's the he's the guy in the mask in yeah. Hostel. Yep. You know, he is the bad guy. He is torturing this other human being who kind of sort of raped, but maybe kind of didn't Again, really. Again, an immediate mirrored image of what happens to that character as well. Is sure. They kind of sort of get raped, but maybe not really. So where is that moment for you? I mean, you would agree that at the end of the film, Antonio Banderas is the psychopathic killer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you feel uh, altruistic, world-class surgeon at any point? Or do you go into this oh, movie yeah. going psychopath? I'm I'm on board with him as a character for a very long time. Sure. I think that he's the good guy when she is trying to escape. I keep thinking you should just go back to him. He knows what's best for you. Sure. Yeah. It's not until we get that martyr's moment where suddenly the boy, you know, it's actually, no, it's when he's running the boy off the road. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, even right. that, even that part of me goes, yeah, he raped your daughter. Run him off the road. Well, that's the thing, right? Is you also see that emotional side of him trying to connect with her mm -hmm. and being identified as a rape victim and you feel for him. Uh, not in the origin story Hannibal feel for him sense, you know? Right. Not in the, oh, you know he's a psychopathic killer who is trapping a woman in his house, but he has a human side. Yeah. This is still just, we're on the fence about whether he is medically quarantining a person or kidnapping and holding her yeah. hostage in his home. And, uh, and that just makes you feel for him even more. So if it's not when he's running the guy off the road. It's when I he mean, locks him up in the room. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as you have somebody naked in chains, Eric, I cannot support you unless they want to be there. It's funny. That's such a it's such a visual image. Uh, it's so powerful of a visual image. That was exactly the moment for me. Yeah. Too. <laughs> I, I really do think it is the visual imagery. It's the point where we look at it and without even needing any real fact or information, we can identify visually. Well, I do know one thing. You've got a guy half naked chained up in a cellar that's not okay mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the point where we've crossed the line uh one other thing i wanted to mention is that this is a uh pedro almodovar mm -hmm. movie and uh, can we see more of these i'd just like to see more of yeah, these, I think we have these movies this is probably one of the most famous uh spanish directors he did uh bad education he's worked with antonio banderas on other stuff he did tie me up tie me down which i think would be awesome for our show um, I don't remember the name of that Penelope Cruz movie. I think it's called, uh, Volver. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, didn't have a lot of time to talk about him because I mean, to be honest with you, I don't know a lot about him, but definitely something I'd want to look more into. Although the last time I said that, <laughs> uh, the future, yeah. let's talk about, which is based on a play by crazy person, Miranda July. Yeah. So we did. You remember her person? I wanted oh. to explore the career more of. Yeah. We did me and you and everyone we know, um, a while and now back. she's Man, back. was that year one? Towards the end near uh, The Shape of Things, yeah, which so, this movie probably has a lot in common with as well. Miranda July is this, uh, I think you hit it on the head. I think the best way to talk about Miranda July is a crazy person. I mean, I haven't heard that show in a long time, but I believe that's how you first described her. That's how me. I still describe her. Yeah. I, anytime anybody mentions Miranda July, the first thing I say is she's crazy. <laughs> she's a nut job. Um, well, she's a nut job in the way you kind of wish all directors were nut jobs. I think you know I, mean? I think you'd be hard pressed to find a director I love who's not a nut job. Right. Um, she's uh, she's done a lot since we um, last talked about her on the show too. She's written a slew of books. Yeah. I mean, I think that was true even back then. But magazine articles, even a bunch of music. Yeah. This was based on, I guess, a play that she had made. Sure. And now we have uh, this this follow up film, this independent film, shot on red, which you know I fucking love. Uh huh. And starting with a talking cat. Yeah, sure. Why not? Miranda July has this really interesting method of storytelling, mm -hmm. which is that I think Miranda July watches Miranda July movies, <laughs> and uh, 
just goes, yep, that was a good movie. Right, right. See, that's the sense I get, too. And has no idea. Everybody else watches Miranda July movies and is busy going, what does that mean? What is that supposed to be? Why is that cat talking? How, did he actually stop time? Is that Moon the old man now? Right. What's going? And you're sitting. Why is she dancing? Is that supposed to be sexy? That can't be sexy. Is it? Wait, does she want to have sex with him right now? Is he raping her? Why is that little girl in a in a <laughs> hole in the ground? And you're sitting there asking just a bunch of questions that, I mean, if somebody were to tell me to. OK, so let's do the reverse experiment of what I previously said for the skin I live in. Mm -hmm. Somebody comes up to me and goes, there's a new Miranda July movie. It involves a couple who's in love that gives up on the internet and they eventually stop time. Also, there's a cat. I would look at you and say, I never want to see that film. Please keep it away from me. <laughs> I hate Juno. And I would walk right. away. <laughs> right. But Miranda July is unbelievably talented in that she can take what I would chalk up as some bullshit indie film and make it something with a particular level of gravity and earnest grace. Oh yeah. That I get so much out of these movies. And I don't know if it's the performances of the characters. I don't know if it's how they interact with each other. I don't know if it's her being in the film so she can commandeer the scene to look and feel the way it needs to. Right. But right around the time this film stopped time, the second time, the first <laughs> yeah. time I rolled my eyes for a good 20 minutes. Sure. But when he, you mean on the couch? Right. I also think, by the way, that two people typing on a couch on their laptops together is a perfect existence. Yeah. I just I, I don't know if the film is trying to speak out against the Internet, and I have plenty to say about that. But uh, I see that image, and unlike the uh, the imagery you just know in the skin I live in, I look at that and go, that's a perfectly acceptable thing. I'm sure yeah. that most people watching right now are going, man, our culture and all we do is play on computers and we don't even connect anymore. I think that's fine. Hang out on your laptops yeah, on the couch. I agree. Stop time. Yeah, the second time he stops time, though, when he starts speaking to the moon, uh -huh. that is a make or break moment in any film. It is, isn't it? When when that that you know what it is? And, and this is a true testament to her filmmaking skills. Mm -hmm. That is the moment in every Coen Brothers movie where I go, I'm out. Yeah. But Miranda July does it. And suddenly the film makes so much sense to me. I get it and I love it. And let's see how this goes now. I had to sort of stop and go, am I okay with this? Shouldn't I be asking? I am strangely okay with this. Yeah. Shouldn't I be asking myself at this moment, uh, wait, hold on. We're introducing sci-fi and in, you know, right. late into the movie as a callback to yeah. a joke from earlier sure. in the movie. Shouldn't I really have a problem? I couldn't make myself have a problem no. with it. And I think that's true of a lot of the Miranda July stuff. Oh, yeah. I just don't know why I want to have a Miranda July problem. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm right there with you. But the Juno thing you said is is on point. It's not just independent film because we see a lot of that. Oh, yeah. And we love it. But when you think indie film, like you think indie band. Yeah. You know, you just kind of. Garden uh, State, Napoleon Dynamite. Right. Understated, ironic film. Yeah, right. Irreverent just humor film. Fucking yeah. that kind of stuff. Just. It's nails on a chalkboard for me from start to finish in any other arena. But Miranda July nails it. She does. Right around the time he starts talking to the moon and they're in that room and she's about to confess that she's been cheating on him. Yeah. I just want him to stop. <laughs> I want him to stop her and be like, don't, I don't want to hear her tell you this because she's crazy. Right. And, she, and right. there's something going on here. Well, it's also the, uh, the, exercise of what's the most interesting thing we could do at this point sure and you kind of i mean you either know exactly how that conversation is going to play out and it's going to be one of the most boring conversations of the whole movie or he's going to stop time you know what yeah. i mean and so we go with the more interesting of the outcomes i mean that doesn't always work it's not a, a great general guideline or anything but god it certainly works here i don't and so i want to focus on this without focusing on negativity and it's hard 
Because without just taking all these other films and throwing them under the bus and going, these suck, why is this one good? That is really the question I want to address. Mm -hmm. The future has a lot in common with a certain ilk of film that I do not like. Yeah. And I don't know why I love the future and why I love Miranda July and why I don't. Is it more substantive? I mean, I don't know if that's true. I think that... I think, if anything, those movies have plenty of substance. They have a lot to say. Just the way they say it, I, you know, you know is so... I think, honestly, that... I don't think we're being any more negative on this genre than we are on every other genre. It just so happens that you and I watch more horror films and so can put more horror and sci-fi and exploitation on double feature that we know have substance. But sure. I think you and I can both agree that most horror films are terrible. Yeah, that's probably true. And we just don't talk about them because we've seen right. so many good ones that we can find a bulk of genre that exists in a good place for us. And I think this genre is the same way. I don't, I don't feel remotely bad saying something like Garden State or Napoleon Dynamite has nothing to say that yeah. part of the film is being understated and and the film is trying to say sometimes there's nothing to say you sure. know what i mean sure and i think that that's a failure in every piece of art i don't care if it's a film or music or a painting or a goddamn dirty limerick sure if your art message is sometimes there's nothing to say fuck you yeah yeah at the core i guess we disagree with that um but there's also, you know, we talk about horror and we could go, yeah, the Children of the Corn movies are goddamn awful. Mm -hmm. But then we still find interesting to, things to say about them. Yeah. So I think there's also something to overexposure to if we just saw every fucking movie in this genre, I'm sure we'd start to adore it just because sure. we would we would get it. Sure. We would see the the common threads. We would go, what is this doing? You know, it becomes that three point scale yeah, a little bit. Exactly. It's okay, this, you know, maybe I wouldn't even liked this movie a couple of years ago, but how is it stacking up against these other films? Sure. What kind of new things is it trying to bring in? Mm -hmm. You know, I think Miranda July, another thing I'm afraid of lumping her in with, but is a conversation that's in the back of my mind, is female filmmakers. Yeah. And that is, uh, you know, it's a, a common theme among a lot of films by female directors Maybe not on this show. You know, we put American Psycho on this show. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I think about Lost in Translation. Sure. As being another movie that is a lot about the air between conversation. Yeah. About the pauses. About, uh, I mean, I don't want to do a whole big chunk on Lost in Translation. But it seems to be a common theme in a lot of movies that are directed by women. And I feel wrong saying that, you know? But, I mean, I there's you got to say that it's I mean, like talking about the eye and going yeah it's all these chinese people and their damn ghosts yeah <laughs> i feel right. like i'm being sexist you know <laughs> fucking women making all these movies about the distance between human beings yeah but if disconnect if you want to if you want to immediately combat that just look into this film and and so the film is i guess at its core you know i didn't know i wouldn't say this from watching the film but the synopsis of the film definitely says something along the lines of you know, they're going to stop using the Internet and change the world. Something like that. It also mentions their cat. Yeah. I think this movie actually starts in the most tragically normal sense, which is anthropomorphic cat. Yeah. That should be. I'll go on here and I'll call Miranda July, you know, a crazy person. But the things that are legitimately crazy versus the things that are societally accepted anthropomorphic animals has to be like at the end of a spectrum for me yeah you know as uh more people on planet earth do it than do not do it but i think that is just batshit nuts yeah i think miranda july being crazy artist totally normal i think miranda july talking to cats yeah uh just absolutely ludicrous yeah, that's fine <laughs> sorry but yeah synopsis so, and talking so cats. They, they quit the internet well, that's also fucking crazy. But but the the weird thing about this, and and to go back to the the feeling of feeling sexist, is they quit the internet, and one of them wins by quitting the internet. The other one loses by quitting the internet. Mm -hmm. The one who loses is the woman, and she loses in the way that nine out of ten films make the man lose. 
it's very uncommon that in a film, especially a film made by a woman, or maybe not, uh, that the woman ends up cheating on the man and then sure. regretting it. Right. I, I mean, I can think of 10, 20 films and TV shows where the woman cheats on the man but doesn't regret it later. And it turns out the sure. man was a scumbag. But the way it usually goes is the guy cheats and he should feel terrible about it. But instead, in this film, right. the guy meets his future self and buys a hairdryer from him and learns about his wife and, <laughs> and becomes a generally fulfilled human being and and finds this acquiesced. Like, Would you use the word fulfilled to describe him? I mean, I don't I don't leave the movie with the sense he's very fulfilled. Well, I think he he gets to a point where when he comes home and he's all we're going to be OK. Yeah, sure. He's reached a point where he goes, wait, our lives aren't over. Yeah. This this is the beginning of everything. And this is good. And this is sure. fine. And I'm a lot more centered and safe now. Sure. To be immediately knocked off that pedestal by going, yeah, you might be, but I'm cheating on you. Yeah. <laughs> right. And leaving right. you. Yeah. And so all of that turns into this really interesting plot that comes back around to you guys killed that fucking cat you monsters <laughs> sure <laughs> which i find to be the uh the least pressing issue of the entire oh, film yeah. i i'm not even sure i would have written it on my calendar mm -hmm. i wouldn't have written it on my calendar because i live in the 21st fucking century and have a calendar on my cell phone right who are these people without the internet it's i don't July. understand this to really put her in a nutshell based on what goes on in this film Miranda July is a person who goes, I found an injured cat on the street. So far, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I've got this. Totally understand. Took that cat to a veterinary hospital. Mm -hmm. All right. Still on board. Gave it a name, which is already crazy sure. to me to name yeah. an animal. But yeah. <laughs> and they're going to kill it. If I don't pick it up in 30 days. Okay. So you, you want the cat to live because you think it, you uh, yeah. have some attachment. I'll still get behind that. Yeah. So. You're going to pick it up in 30 days. Now, this is where this is where the disparity comes in. I go, OK, what date is that? Uh, it's you know, the 31st. I'll put a reminder on my phone and it'll go off and I'll go, yeah, cat day. And I'll go sure. pick up the cat. <laughs> right. Right. Miranda July goes, oh, my God, on the 31st, our lives are over because one of us, <laughs> one of us has to be here the whole time. And and we can't ever go to Florence at the same time. We'd have to right. go separately. And sure. if. If you want to go skydiving, I can't be your tandem buddy and we have to sure. sell our tandem bike. And if if we ever want to get dinner for two, we're going to have to hire a cat sitter or eat. Right. You can eat. You eat something and then I'll go and eat my stuff. But our lives are over after this cat. That's Miranda July. I you don't ever think like that, though. No, because it, I don't know, man. Like, all right. So I'm 27. I decided I want to come out to California for a couple years. I've definitely had moments where I go. Well, God, then I'm then I'm basically thirty, and then my life is just fucking over. And I just I, I thought I was going to be so much smarter, and I want to watch the news, but there's so much to catch up on. I mean, they're kind of reading my thoughts at points in this movie. Yeah. Also, having a cat locks you down. That's the thing is, the second something on my calendar is followed by, and then your life ends. I take it off my calendar. Right. <laughs> Yeah. No, you're right. This is, again, another reason I don't own pets. I don't want to get locked down by them. But I do understand, you know, this isn't a, a place I find myself in, but a place I can at least identify with a little bit of. I wouldn't frantically, you know, uh, run around quitting everything I do and uh, unplugging my internet because I think I'm going to die because I have to pick up a cat in 30 days. But there are times when I think, you know, you start fast forwarding through all these, well, what's it going to be like when I'm, I've done this since school. I'm going to be out of school in three years and then look how fucking old I am. I won't have done anything with my life, you know? Right. Uh, or the, the same kind of identity in the, I'm going to do a song every day for 30 days. Yeah. And then you can't do the first fucking, so this is like me writing end of state. Sure. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, all right, let's do the first song and go and go. Do the song. I'm going to get some popcorn. Right, right. I see a lot of where they're coming from. Yeah. 
you know, I think they're meant to be a little bit of caricatures. Sure. I don't think they're meant to, to represent actual people. Well, one is. This is the, <laughs> right. It's the logical conclusion of let's really extrapolate as far as we possibly could on these, you know, these ideas of dates on our calendar. Mm -hmm. Also, maybe they don't have phones that have calendars. I mean, the technology in this movie looks like it's from, you know, 1998. They have a, a webcam that sits on top of their computer. Yeah. Well, they have, they have the <laughs> technology know. to make cat gloves. So you're right. You're right. They do. Do you think the film has an anti-technology bent? I, you know, I, I don't know about, hmm. is this just a catalyst for them? Is it, I think about the same, you know, look at it with the environmentalism, right? It's using environmentalism in the movie but then the end kind of goal and environmental the the end conclusion is sort of apathy. Yeah. Sort of well, no one really gives a fuck. I don't know if that's meant to say something cynical about people or if it's just to go, this isn't a cause. Planting trees doesn't do anything. I think But I'm I'm more worried about that with the internet if it's you actually know what I think speaks to me more than the whole fucking beige vest. Yeah, please is when that little girl buries herself outside. Mm -hmm. and then comes in crying. Yeah. That, to me, is this moment in the film where it's saying the world is really scary when it's just your your head in it. Sure. If you're actually a part of the world and you're just a, you're just a bystander to the planet, you're going to be overwhelmed. Right. And you're not going to be able... Because the thing is, is one person isn't going to be able to fix all the fucking crises of the environment. Sure, sure. And if you don't have the internet to to connect you to the other people in the world, mm -hmm. the world is going to become a terribly overwhelming experience. Yeah, it's too big. It's huge. Yeah. The internet makes the world smaller. Yeah, exactly. You know, it, it allows everybody to talk. I wonder about it because Miranda July being an independent artist, probably relies on the internet a ton. Well, I mean, so I'm not what you and I both watch this off Netflix, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. So, you know, I'm not 100% sure she would make a rallying cry against the internet, but I do think it kind of feeds into this idea that people have about uh, the internet pulls us, you know, apart, get off Facebook and experience real life. Uh -huh. And I don't, you know, I don't believe that at all. I think I love people too much to hate the internet. Yeah. You know, the internet is all of us at once. Yeah. It's the reason you and I uh, still keep up with each other every fucking week, yeah. even though we live what might as well be on different planets at mm -hmm. this point. Yeah. And we found this whole community of people who could, you know, this is the wrong time to pick on the internet. Yeah, I know. When Double Feature just gets kickstarted. Yeah. I just think you look nuts. I think you look crazy. <laughs> I think if people are doing that thing where they're going, I just want to unplug from the internet and, you know, stop looking down at my phone and start looking up at people, they're probably using the internet wrong. Yeah. After all, you can meet people on Craigslist. You got that hair dryer. You buy it for $3. What a deal. Or best offer. <laughs> or best offer. Speaking of internet... Uh, double feature show at gmail.com. You can write us a letter using the electronic mail mm. or go to our website, which is doublefeatureshow.com. Uh, so, as much as I would like to say we're done being confused by independent film, I think we have a smart move. Mm. And that's to uh, take something that we were more comfortable with by doing Miranda July, a female filmmaker that we've already covered. Two things that Double Feature does really well. Makes quirky films, but is somebody we want to evangelize, yeah. right? Quirky films, Double Feature kind of uncomfortable with. <laughs> Miranda July uh, should also be uncomfortable with. But, you know, a woman making independent film. That is an area we understand. Right. In fact, we might be too comfortable at this point. Yeah, so next week we're going to kick in the overdrive. We're going to bring some Wes Anderson into the mix. So we're going to go probably the highest uh, ratio of quirk to commercial success that yeah. we possibly could yes everyone but us on planet earth understands wes anderson but we're gonna take the easy route so first we're gonna do the sessions which is um that john hawks movie i see what you're going with here and then we're going to pair that with the easiest the easiest wes anderson film moonrise kingdom the easiest uh we'll see if you live up to that next week watch more fucking film bye